Thank you. So, so the brain is something that is of increased uh, attention and talked about on and on these days because scientists are beginning to understand it with greater and greater detail and also because we're becoming victims of our own success and then we have brilliant graduate students that develop cures for cancer and it's increasingly common that the bottleneck for us living long productive lives is increasingly our brain. In addition, technology has advanced in immense uh, 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 rapid ways. For example, we have uh, computers that are more powerful than supercomputers of the past that we can now keep into our phone. And so a natural question that we can ask ourselves is, what happens if we try to get these two things to intersect together? And so I'm primarily interested in this because I have a training in both uh, computer technology for my PhD work as well as understanding the brain in my postdoctoral work. And I'm intrigued about seeing how we can skate towards where the puck is going and see how these things intersect. And so if we think about a brain-computer interface, which is a system that elicits a direct communication pathway between the brain and an external device, we can ask ourselves what interesting things can we do with them. And there already are, already are some examples of that. Uh, we might be familiar with people, let's say, who have a spinal cord injury and their brain is totally intact, but they've lost the communication pathways uh, to their muscles. Can they uh, uh, directly map neural signals to control a robotic arm? Or imagine someone who has a stroke recovery and we would like to, someone who has a stroke and we'd like to help them with rehabilitation. So we might want to continue to ask ourselves, can we get this to scale to a variety of other applications and for the people in this situation to make it more ubiquitous? What are the challenges? And I thought the way I'd communicate to, to you is the way that I've gone along the path of doing this. And it's really been a path of imagining that we have paintbrushes and we have painters and we're trying to make paintings. And so the punchline is that to get this, this intersection to work, we need uh, multiple paintbrushes, we have to be clever in how we use them, and we have to be aware of the painting that we're, that we're trying to draw. And so I'll start with an example of neuroscience, or if we just take an understanding of neuroscience, what types of things can we do? And so imagine the simplest possible scenario where I would like to directly uh, take neural signals from your brain so that you can communicate just one bit. And so the way you could communicate one bit is that maybe zero represents you imagining squeezing your left hand, and maybe one represents you imagining squeezing your right hand. And so what we do is we take these neural signals using a, a brain wave cap on your head, and we do some signal analysis to do that. And of course, neuroscience has to be used to do this. And in particular, we have to take into consideration the biophysics and the neurophysiology and how the patterns of neural signals are different when you imagine left versus imagining right. So we did some of that in our research group, and we showed that we could vast, vastly improve the rate at which we could get one bit out of your brain. And so we can get a picture like this, where from brain signals, you go to moving uh, a dot on the screen. But the next question you might ask yourselves is that's somewhat underwhelming, is that all I can do? And so the punchline is that with just this paintbrush and not being so clever, it's limited in the, in the drawings that you, can, that you can elicit. So in addition, what we need to do is be clever in how we do our analytics. And if we do that, integrate them together, perhaps we can make better paintings. So in that regard, the, the high-level insight that we had is that uh, we really should be thinking about appropriate uses of feedback. And perhaps the best example of this is thinking about uh, someone has a number in their head uh, between 1 and 20, and I get to ask them a question. Is it lettuce less than or greater than this? And of course, the first question you ask is 10. And then what you do is you listen to their response, which is binary, uh, uh, yes or no, and from that you pivot upon. In many situations, that's in essence what we're doing. The only issue is that there's noise, because the electrical signals that we get are a noisy reflection of what you've imagined. And so it's in essence as if we want to play 20 questions with the brain. And so also, if we're clever in how we set this up, can we elicit interesting applications? And so if we imagine someone perhaps who would like to navigate a path with their wheelchair, just with their brain, what we did is that number between 1 and 20 now becomes a path, a smooth path in two dimensions that you'd like to travel. And we don't know that, and we ask you a question. We ask you, is it less than or greater than 10? That corresponds to another path, as you see on the screen. So the user takes a look at the path that's in their head, not shown, and they take a look at the path on the screen, see where they overlap and look at the first place where they differ. If, they, if it's uh, clockwise, they imagine squeezing their left hand. If it's counterclockwise, they imagine squeezing their right hand. We do statistics on that based upon the neuroscience we know, and we ask a new question by doing some applied math algorithms. And what you see with time, we can navigate this path from San Diego to Princeton, New Jersey, let's say. 
And so we went one step further and we actually uh, collaborated with some aerospace engineers at the University of Illinois and we actually demonstrated that you could use this paradigm to fly uh, a remote controlled airplane over the cornfields of Illinois. Not to say that in the future pilots will be doing this with their brains, but just to be provocative about the appropriate use of wetting these paintbrushes together to do clever things. This is uh, perhaps best demonstrated in an article by The Economist uh, uh, called Put Your Thinking Cap On, uh, pun intended, talking about things that we used to think were science fiction can now fast become a reality by taking our increasingly better understanding of neuroscience and better analytics and merging them. But uh, if Steve Jobs was in the audience, there'd be something about this he doesn't like. And what he would not like about this is the form factor, right? And so it's great that we've gotten the neuroscience and the analytics together, but until we get better ways of, pro of probing these signals in less uh, unobtrusive ways, in less obtrusive ways, our ability to apply this for a wide range of scenarios will be limited. And so this leads to the next paintbrush that we began to realize that what we need to integrate, and that's novel ways of developing sensors to pick up the things that we're interested in, and perhaps we can make better paintings. And so if we boil down to that, you know, that same picture from The Economist, and why is it that you know, systems typically have to look like that, the punchline very succinctly is that biology is soft and curvy, linear, and elastic, but electronics are built upon semiconductor wafers, which are rigid, planar, and brittle. So can we develop a way to perhaps merge these two together? And it turns out I was very fortunate to collaborate with material scientists at the University of Illinois and develop a procedure to basically peel off a thin layer of electronics. Anything, if you make it thin enough, becomes flexible, and then try to optimize it to integrate it with the skin. So we have collaborated for about three years on doing this, and we're able to build a class of technologies that we call epidermal electronics, or electronic skin. So we can integrate very thin electronics and make sure they're mechanically matched to the properties of skin so that they can bend with the skin, they can stretch with the skin, and again, and the, for the purpose of being provocative, we can embed them inside of temporary tattoos. So they're sometimes called tattoo electronics or digital tattoos. So what you see in this picture here is that you can take the backside of a tattoo, transfer the thin electronics onto there. When you mount it onto your skin, uh, it's, uh, the electronics are invisible and it still bends with your skin. The system is very multifunctional. You can put antennas on there, power them wirelessly, put LEDs, you can monitor temperature, et cetera. And of course, you can monitor the electrical rhythms of the body. And so these signals can indeed pick up the brain, the, the brain waves, the electrical rhythms of the brain. And so in this picture, what you see on the left is my head. Uh, part of my head is covered with the traditional electrodes. The other part of my head is covered with the epidermal electronics. We plug, the, pl plug them in the same type of electrical systems to see what are the type of brain waves that we could pick up. And what you can see uh, when I'm closing my eyes, eliciting the posterior dominant rhythm, the epidermal electronics are, are just as strong as with traditional uh, uh, electrodes. So what this means now is that we've taken these three paintbrushes, we've integrated them together, and now we can imagine a wider class of paintings. Uh, but let's not forget the importance of having a great painter. And so even uh, with the same set of paintbrushes, if we're more clever in how we integrate them together, perhaps we can build even better drawings. And so what I've done since I've been here at uh, UC San Diego is collaborate with some expert, expert cognitive scientists across the street at the Salk Institute, and we're able to develop a paradigm where in this picture of this gentleman, it might be hard to see, but he actually has these sensors on his forehead. Okay, and we optimize these sensors, really taking a neurophysiology, applied math, uh, electronics integration together, and if we really optimize that, we can pick up interesting brain signals reflective of cognition. And so we can play this question and answer game with the brain, where I flash images in front of you, some of which are irrelevant to you, and some of which periodically elicit an attentional response, and we monitor your brain's uh, a response to irrelevant versus your brain's response to important as given by black and red, and we can pick up these signals with high statistical accuracy that have the same timing and the same shape as what you pick up with traditional technologies. And the second that we have a brain signal that we can extract that's a measure of cognition, we can do many things with this. And so for example, I mentioned we can uh, the, imagine the same applications as before, like recovery from deficits and rehabilitation, but, in, uh, but in, uh, now, because we can pick up brain signals reflective of cognition in a very unobtrusive manner, we can imagine applications of monitoring the onset of something like Alzheimer's disease, where we know that cognitive impairment is elicited, so that black and that red signal are not as close together. Likewise for depression and a variety of other situations. And if we stand back and we look at these applications that I mentioned, these in some sense are all defense. We're trying to sort of take someone who has a deficit and help them get back to normalcy. But now because we've integrated all these things together and they're very unobtrusive, 
Can we also perhaps play offense? And so, of course, I didn't imagine this at first glance, but we can now think about our applications within the context of education and training and entertainment. And I imagine a lot of you can use your imagination to think about other scenarios of integrating these together. And so, to, to sort of conclude, the last point I'd like to make is that uh, here I've mentioned our interest in making nice paintings that can help us, say entertainment, education, rehabilitation. But when we wet all these technologies together, in addition, we can think about very ominous unintended consequences that could have adverse applications in terms of our privacy or people from a quantified self perspective becoming obsessive, compulsive, and whatnot. So the punchline is that there's really a balance between these and we should be very aware of this uh, when, we, when we move forward. So to close, uh, this was the picture that Steve Jobs didn't like. We had the analytics, we had the neuroscience, but the sensors were missing. What our hope and what we're trying to do in our research group is to replace that picture and imagine that this was the picture in The Economist. So thank you. <clears throat>